Where are you headed? It's a, it's a great question. And we've been talking about that for the last two weeks. Where are you headed in life? And we're not talking about where you're headed on vacation, where you're headed on your career path or anything like that. We're talking about where are you headed spiritually? What, what is your sense of where you're at and where you need to be? And what direction are you moving toward God? Or maybe if you do an honest evaluation, maybe you're at a place where you're stagnant or you're falling away from God. But regardless, it's a great question for you to consider, especially as we kind of get into this time of year. Believe it or not, the weather will be changing. <laughs> Doesn't seem like it's possible, but it will. And as we get into fall and schools are back in session and we kind of get into this new season that we feel like is upon us, ask yourself, where are you headed? Where are you headed? And are you headed in a direction that's going to build your faith and establish and grow that relationship with Jesus Christ? Or are you in a place where, well, maybe, maybe you aren't? We've been talking for several weeks now, and we, we've been talking really about biblical fellowship and koinonia and how that helps grow us as Christians. We've also been talking about what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? I've always thought of a disciple as a person who, who, is, who is following Jesus, a lifelong devoted follower of Jesus, who is going to actually do what Jesus says, to follow his will, to follow his ways in their life, and they strive for worshiping him and making him the center of all that they are and all that they do in their life. But I think it's important that we just simply go back to Scripture and just see how did Jesus define a disciple. And we do that quite simply in Matthew 4.19. Matthew 4.19 is when Jesus called the first disciples. And there's, here's what he called them to. Matthew uh, 4.19 says this. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So there's really three parts to that verse. There's follow me and then I will make you, Jesus will transform you, he will make you fishers of men. In other words, that's the mission of the Great Commission, that we are to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And so we define a disciple based on uh, Matthew 4.19 like this. A disciple is someone who is following Jesus, who is being transformed by Jesus, and who is committed to the mission of Jesus. Follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. And we ask you to consider, <clears throat> excuse me, does this describe you? Are you someone who actually does what Jesus asks you to do? Or are you one of those that struggles? That maybe you hear what Jesus wants you to do, but you, you have this break point where you struggle with putting it into action. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. If you have a paper Bible, just turn there. Gospel of Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 7. You can also follow along on your iPad, on your uh, cell phone. You can download the Oakwood app, go to sermon notes and all the scriptures and bullet points and everything will be there for you. But we want you to engage the word of God this morning. And so, again, we're trying to define Bible things with Bible terms and allow the word of God to speak to us and convict us. And so here in Matthew 7, and we're going to begin with verse 24, is the end of a sermon that Jesus preached. Now, Jesus, the son of God, was the best preacher of all time. I mean, when he preached and he talked to crowds, crowds would walk away and say, he talks like someone I've never heard before. I mean, the depth of his knowledge and his insight and the application points that he makes are incredible. And so Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, he's actually been preaching in Matthew's gospel for chapter 5, 6, and 7. What we're actually going to read right now is the closing of the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount is amazing. Do you remember how it starts? The Sermon on the Mount starts in Matthew chapter 5 uh, with Jesus talking about blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And, and you know that section of scripture if you know your Bible. It's called the Beatitudes. Jesus has been preaching through the Beatitudes. Right after that he challenges his believers to be salt and light to the world. After that, he talks about how he's not come to, to abolish the law. He's come to fulfill it in all righteousness as the Son of God. That he's going to keep it perfectly. 
He, he talks about murder. He talks about holding a grudge against a brother or sister in Christ. He talks about adultery. He talks about divorce. He talks about taking an oath. He talks about how to love your enemies. He talks about giving to the needy. He tells, he tells the listeners how they are to pray. He talks about things like fasting and, and how to store up for yourself treasures in heaven. He even has a section in there where he talks about worry. He says, hey, don't, don't worry about anything. And he, he gives this comparison about, look at the birds of the air. They don't toil. They don't sit there and worry about where their next meal is going to come from or where their shelter has come from. And Jesus challenges that crowd and says, how much more will I take care of you? He's going through all of these different things. He talks about how to discern true and false disciples and, and whether we're to judge one another. He also gives us that famous part about ask and seek and knock. And at the end of all of this, we get to Matthew 7, verse 24. It's a section that you may have heard before. And this is what Jesus says. He starts out by saying, therefore, in lieu of all that he's preached in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, he says, therefore... Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. Did you catch that? Anyone who hears the words of Jesus and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. The rains came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Verse 26, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. It's a good, good way to end a sermon, isn't it? But do you see what Jesus is saying? There are some who listen to the word, who hear these words of mine and put them into practice. And they have houses built on the rock and they're blessed. And then there's those that hear the words and do not put them into the practice. And they build these houses on shifting sand. You see, what Jesus is doing here is he's giving us this equation that I think bears out in the Christian life. Jesus introduces us to the spiritual equation of sorts, which is hearing plus doing equals the difference. A blessed life. We'll read about that in a little bit. But hearing and doing together equals the difference that everybody wants to make in their life. The difference you want Jesus to make in your life. And what's amazing about this concept is this is not the only place it appears. It's actually in the book of James. So if you're in Matthew's gospel, turn to James. It's in the back of the New Testament. So moving toward Revelation. Book of James chapter 1. What's interesting here is James is the brother of Jesus. He writes this small little book. It's full of practical application of how to live the Christian life. How to walk out your faith. And it's, and it's here it's here in James chapter 1 that he kind of does a commentary. He kind of comes alongside Jesus' words. And in James chapter 1, verse 22, it says this. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Now, if you stop... The verse right there, and you didn't read beyond the period, you're like, wow, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. How could listening to the word of God be deception to someone? Well, then you read the rest of the verse. It's because you hear it and you don't do what it says. What did Jesus say? If you hear it and you don't do what it says, you have built your foundation on sand. And when life comes your way, the storms... And they blow and they beat and they flood your home. It will not stand because it was built on a foundation of sand. And what is the difference? Those who hear and do and those who hear and do not do. Man, that's the essence of walking out the Christian life, isn't it? 
Sometimes I think the struggle with this is not universal. Sometimes I think this is like an American Christian, an American church thing. But then I suppose there could be people in churches in Cambodia or South America or somewhere that they struggle with the exact same thing. I read and hear the word of God. I'm dedicated to hearing the sermon. Maybe I'm dedicated to a Bible study during the week. I'm, I'm dedicated to a, a group of people getting together, looking at scripture together, applying it to our lives. But I don't actually do what it says. I might amen it. I might like it. I might post it on my Facebook. But I actually don't put it into practice. And James says, then you're deceiving yourself. If you hear it and you do not do it, it is deception. And I wonder, is, is this an American church thing? Because I think what he's talking about here in James 1.22 happens in churches every week. I think it could be happening in our church every week. In fact, it may be happening right now that you would hear scripture but you wouldn't actually do what it says. We gather and we're dedicated to being taught. And many of you know a ton about the Bible. Those of you that are older than me and have had more time in the Word than me, you probably know the Bible better than me. Many of you know a ton of what Scripture says. But if you were to say what your struggle is in your Christian walk, it's the fall off between what you know and what you actually put into practice. We love to gather and to be taught, but we fall off because we don't actually do what Scripture commands us to do. We're dedicated to come and listen, but we don't make progress in the application of the text. Some of you say something like this. I bought a treadmill. I bought a treadmill. You're like, wow, you bought a treadmill. I brought it home to my house. Unpacked it from the box, set it up. I even plugged it into the wall. Every once in a while, there's that beep sound to, to remind you to get on it. Now, if someone told you that, would you be like, yes? Wow, dude, you have a treadmill. That is awesome. Your, your treadmill knowledge is incredible. Wow. Do you ever get on the treadmill? Nope, but I know all about it. I can tell you all about it. I hooked it up. I built it. Put the, I mean, I put it to, I plugged it in. It is in the room. And we laugh because it's absurd, right? No one's like, wow, you got a treadmill. That's incredible. No, it's when you get on the treadmill and you, and you talk about how many miles you've done or how much time you've done or you start putting the treadmill into practice, then is when we would be really applauding. But yet, I feel like sometimes it goes this way in the Christian life. Maybe for some of you, it's, hey, I bought some weights. Go pump some iron. I got it in the garage. Wife's a little hacked about it because she can't park her car in there anymore. But that's okay. I've got the weights. It's in the garage. It's 129 in my garage yesterday. But are you lifting the weights? Nope. But I bought weights. They're in the garage. Fancy weights, man. Yeah. But if you buy the weights, and you don't put them in to practice. And some of you are like, hey, I came to church. I, pull, I brought, brought, brought my family. I pulled into the parking lot. I, I got through the crowds in the, in the lobby. I found my seat. They prayed some words. I, I said some words, during, sang some words during the, during the worship time, made a joyful noise unto the Lord. I, I was actually moved. In, in that time, I mean, I mean, I shed a tear a couple of times, and then I listened to the sermon, and I was like, man, the, the Word of God is amazing, and it really is, it's, it's amazing, I'm not being sarcastic about that, the Word of God is amazing, and it, it, was, it amazed me, and I heard the Word of God, and then I went out, and I lived my life like I'd never heard a darn thing about the Lord, His church, the Bible, or anything. I even teared up in emotion a couple times during the service. But when I go out this week, you won't see any change in my life. And what James would say to you is no, 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 no. You're only deceiving yourself if you don't put the word into practice. And then he gives us this in verse 23. 
Anyone who listens to the word, here we go again, the listeners, anyone who listens to the word and does not do what it says, uh uh-oh, is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, he goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. That sounds absurd. Why do you look in the mirror in the first place, right? You look in the mirror because you care about what you look like. You want to fix something there. And some of you spend a lot of time in front of the mirror. And I know that because I've seen you in the lobby. So you spend a lot of time in front of the mirror. 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 45, an hour, hour and a half. I mean, it's like a facelift every week, right? I mean, you spend a lot of time in the mirror. Now, here's the thing is, some of you don't spend as much time in front of the mirror as others. And again, you can experience that in the lobby sometimes. But the deal is, is most of us look in the mirror, right, in the morning. We, we, we look in the mirror. Why? It's because we want to see. And here's the thing is, I, I know you don't think I could do this, but supernatural pastoral power, Okay. I know how long each one of you spends in front of the mirror every day. And you're like, that's impossible. No, I can actually tell you. You stand in front of the mirror long enough until something changes. And when you get it changed the way you want it to change, then you'll leave the mirror. You stand in front of the mirror until it gets better. That's what you do. We stand in front of the mirror until the things change, and we do something about what we see in the mirror. That's the example he's giving us here in the text. Is the mirror is the Bible, it's the Word of God. And he says, peer into this Word, and when you see things, they're like, whoa, that is not good. I need to change that. You actually work on it and keep in the mirror until you change. Our behavior and our heart is exposed in this mirror, but many times when our behavior and our heart and our mindset and our attitude is exposed in this word, we just go, oh, wow. Wow. Man, I, I, amen. Amen. That's really good. Did you hear that? Did you read that? I'm, I'm going to put that on my Instagram right now. Wow. Man, it's good scripture there. But nothing changes because you don't actually do what the text asks you to do. Or worse, sometimes we do this. We go up to somebody, would you pray for me about that? Pray pray for me. And sometimes I'm like, we don't need more prayer. Prayer is good. We do need people to pray. We don't need more prayer. We just need follow through. We need somebody to say, hey, I've been praying for you about that. Can I just ask you, are you doing something about that? Because you got convicted by looking in the mirror of the word of God. Did it change anything in your life? Because here's the fact, right? Getting your makeup and your hair right, getting the outside of your body right, has far less to do with the direction and the quality of your life than getting your heart right. And many times, I wonder if the outside sometimes follows the inside of our hearts. And I bet when you made the biggest mistake of your life, that sin that you regret forever, I bet you your hair and your makeup looked great. But you weren't applying what the Word of God says. You see, in the real world, no one gets credit for looking in the mirror. All of you that looked in the mirror this morning and didn't do anything about it, no one came up to you and said, you're so pretty today. You don't get credit for just looking in the mirror. You get credit for what you do about what you are seeing in the mirror. You don't go around to people and go, but I looked in the mirror. Well done, well done. And then it goes on, verse 25. But whoever looks intently, here we go again, whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom. What's he talking about there? Perfect law. He's talking about the scripture. It's talking about the commands in Scripture, the perfect law that gives freedom. But let's be honest for a moment, okay? Some of us don't feel like the perfect law gives freedom. We don't find the Bible very liberating. We find it more restrictive, for being honest. 
It's restrictive, right? When it tells you how to live, that's what hearers do, and that's where their understanding stops because they didn't ever apply it. But here's the thing. Those that become doers of the word because they do what the Scripture says, they discover otherwise. Growing up, I was taught, you give to the Lord first, the tithe, the 10%. You save some for the future for yourself, and you live on the rest. You give, you save, then you spend. World has it, you spend, and you spend, and you spend. Bible says you give, you save, and then you spend. And at first, when I was a teenager especially, that is super restrictive. That, that's not freedom. But you start applying that, you grow up a little bit. It didn't seem very liberating at first, but it creates financial freedom eventually. Actually ended up being a good thing to do. What about the command that we forgive Forgive one another. Forgive those who, who do evil, speak evil against you. That didn't seem very liberating to me at first. In fact, I felt like the person sinning against me was being liberated. I just felt like if I forgive them, I'm just letting them off the hook. Anybody ever feel that way? And yet, when you forgive someone, and you don't lord over them what they said or what they did, you find out it is freeing and liberating because when I don't Forgive someone, it's like I've created my own prison. And when I let it go and I open that door, I'm out because I've released myself of being the judge and jury about what happens in their future or whether they're going to get theirs. Doesn't sound liberating at first, but when you walk it out and you actually do what Scripture says, you find out, wow, that's pretty awesome. That's, That's actually a really good thing. But only the doers get to experience that. What about the fact that the Bible says that God works through authority in your life? As a child and as a teenager, he works through the parents. The parents are your authority. Then the civil people become your authority. It talks about the government and, and that we're supposed to be good citizens and the government be, you know, has authority over your life. And, and, and law enforcement has uh, some authority over your life and all these things. And then it even gets into, as you read deeper, spiritual authority in your life. And that was really difficult as a teenager and even in my early 20s. It was difficult. It did not feel liberating. It did not feel like that was the perfect law that gives freedom was for me to have to do what these people said and to be, to be submissive to them and to treat them well. It was difficult. It didn't seem very freeing or liberating. But then you start applying that principle to your life and you see how God uses it and you see how God blesses it. And I could go on and on and on with all the commands of Scripture and what it asks us to do that doesn't seem like freedom. It doesn't seem like a perfect law that gives freedom. It doesn't seem very liberating. And yet when we live it out, it is amazing. What's the difference that you actually did what the Scripture told you to do? You actually lived it out. So let's finish verse 25. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. How many people this morning want to be blessed? How many people want to be cursed? Any cur- and nobody wishes to be cursed? Everyone blessed? Everyone would like to be blessed? How would you like to have the blessing and favor of the Lord in your life? Anyone? Okay. Okay. Everybody, everybody wants that, right? What does it say here? Not forgetting what you've heard, but doing it, you'll be blessed in what you do. Why? Because you're actually applying the word of Scripture. In our remaining remaining minutes this morning, I want to share just a couple of thoughts with you on this. And the first one is this. Small groups help bridge the gap between information and application, between hearing and doing. Small groups help bridge the gap between information and application, between hearing and doing. You've heard a lot in the last few weeks about growth groups starting here at Oakwood and that we want everyone to be a part of a group. And here's the reason why. Because when you have other Christian brothers and sisters that you allow in your life that actually get to know you and get to know your heart and get to know your attitudes in your mind, And you say, hey, here's where I'm headed. That's what this whole series has been about. Where are you headed? 
Here's where I'm headed. And you love those people in your life. Guess what? They help you stay where you are headed. They help keep you on that path. You need people in your life that will help push you and guide you and direct you toward God and not away from God. You need those kind of people. You need Jesus with some flesh on to help speak truth in your life. And I think that those Christian friendships and relationships are sometimes the difference maker between hearing the word and applying it. You're much more likely to apply it if you have someone come up to you next week and go, did you apply it? If you don't have any, that in your life, then guess what? You bought a treadmill. <laughs> well done. I don't get on the treadmill, but I, got, I, bought, I bought one by golly. No one's cheering you because you bought the treadmill. They cheer what you accomplish on the treadmill. Why? Because you don't become a hearer. You're now a doer. You're doing something about it. And I could give you so many examples of this. But Amy and I were in a group about 12 years ago. We've been in many small groups through the years, lots of different people in the church. About 12 years ago, we, we started this group. It was just kind of a hodgepodge thing, got people. Um, we ended up with, this, with the five, five families, five couples in it. Several of us have kids. Couple, a couple of the couples didn't have kids. Um, but we were just there to just study the word and, and, and help each other grow spiritually. That was the heart behind it. We had this one family that became the host home, and so we went over to their house. They had beautiful home, great living room space. We just sat there and just, man, read the Bible, talked, and just, just, our, our, we're just growing in Christ. But what was amazing what happened is like we really got to know each other, and we really got to love each other. We really got to know each other, really got to love each other. So what happened is the guys started hanging out. Um, we started poker night. Okay, it was sanctified poker, though, as holy, holy poker. No, we did. We, we have, holy. So, so this guy that was a part of our group, he had a man cave in the backyard. It was actually just a shed where you'd, like, store your mower and all your dirty stuff. And, but he had made it into this man cave. It had air conditioning. It had, you know, heating and cooling lights. It was insulated. Dude, it was awesome. And he bought a poker table. So all the guys from small group could go and... And we played poker together, and we would, just, we would just use chips, just plastic chips. You know, there's no money. Well, I, I, okay, eventually we started doing M&Ms. We started doing M&Ms. We never did money. We did do M&Ms, so that's, you know, confessions of a pastor. Um, we, but let me tell you what happened, okay? Because it's not, it's not really about you starting a poker club with a bunch of your guy friends. What started happening is as we did that, we do it once a month, and, and sometimes we do it twice a month, much to the chagrin of all the ladies in the group. Uh, but we just started talking while we were playing cards and just sharing life. I remember one time, one of the guys was having a really hard time and he just kind of let it all hang out. And we stopped in the middle of poker and gathered around him and prayed for him. It was a powerful moment. He was in tears, we were all in tears. And I was like, man, this is Christianity here. <laughs> when was the last time you had that happen? Where you just had some brothers and sisters that just like came around you, just prayed for you, gathered around, you got to know them, they got to know you. And it was awesome because you're like, man, these are my brothers and sisters in Christ, and we're not going to just be merely hearers here. We're going to be doers as well. This, this couple and these families were near and dear to us, and we did life together. We went to lake. We had barbecues, let the kids play, did all kinds of things together. And then it came the day where he got a job opportunity in a place called Stillwater, Oklahoma. Nothing ever good happens in Stillwater. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's for my OSU friends, so... Um, but no, he, he got a job opportunity making more money in Stillwater, and they, they decided, hey, we're going to move. I was like, man, hate that. Kind of blew up our group. Um, just kind of fizzled out. We had another couple move, and it just kind of fizzled out. And didn't hear much from him, didn't know what was going on. It was, it was several years later, five, six, seven years later. He shows up here at the church on a Sunday morning by himself, and I'm talking to him. like, man, what is going on? How are you and your wife, and how are the kids? And, He's like, well, just so you know, we got a divorce. What? Yeah. And uh, I committed a crime, and I may actually have to do time for it. He stole some money. What? W what happened, dude? I mean, you're my, you're my brother in the Lord. I mean, we prayed together. We 
like you were growing, like you helped lead some of the sessions sometime. What happened? And you know what he said? When we moved to Stillwater, we never got involved in a church. We just quit going all together, and we never found a group of people. Because we knew they were struggling in their marriage and had struggled in the past. They're in a really good place when they left. You just wonder how life would be different if they'd gotten involved in a church and they found some people that would help hold them accountable to the word of Scripture and say, hey, live this out. Don't merely listen to it again. Some of you don't need, a, you don't need another Bible study. You don't need another sermon. You just need to go live it out. But you need to allow some people in your life to do it because this is the truth. Last thing this morning. Friends don't let friends hear and do nothing because doing makes the difference. Real Christian brothers and sisters of Christ, real friends, don't let friends hear it and do nothing. If they see you straying, if they see you, you, you know, in impure lust thoughts, if they see you cussing, if they see you pulling away from your spouse, if they see you tempted at work to do something that you shouldn't do, if they see something, they have the right, they, they have the right as a brother and sister in Christ and because you've allowed them in your life to know you and to love you, to come and walk beside you and encourage you and say, hey, that ain't right. And your, life, your new life in Christ Jesus, that's not a reflection of that. You're going back to the old ways. Stay on the straight and narrow way which leads to life that is truly life. And I'm telling you, a brother and a sister in Christ, a Christian friend, can help so much. And I wonder this as we close this morning. If God's word were put into practice in your life, how different would your life be? I mean, if you actually just like lived out, you just did what scripture said. And I wonder for us collectively as God's church, how different would our church be if people didn't just hear the word, but they actually put it into practice, actually did what it said. Because here at Oakwood, we're wanting to grow, to know, to love, and to live Jesus. We're growing to know, love, and live Jesus. And so you say, yes, that sounds great, yes, but how? I'm telling you one way this morning, one way, is to allow some people into your life, some Christian friends, that you can lean into and that you can be honest with, and allow them to stir it up for the gospel with you, and watch the work that God does in your life. I know some of you are like, mm-mm, I ain't, get, I ain't getting in no growth groups. No one's going to make me be friends with other Christians and study the word and grow in my faith. You can't make me. No, I can't. But I'm asking you. And I would give you an example of a man named Jesus. Oh, now the Jesus card. Yeah. His group called the disciples, 12 ordinary guys. But they spent three years with Jesus. And you read about him in the book of Acts and you see what a difference God made in their lives. And guess what, it didn't stop there. They told others who told others who told others who told others who lived it out and became Christianity and came even into this sanctuary today. Why? Because they didn't merely hear the word, they did what it said. They did the great commission, make disciples. Are you on that great commission mission? And are you willing to grow, even if it makes you uncomfortable, in Jesus Christ?